All persons having business before the Honorable Associate Judges, now presiding of the District Columbia Court of Appeals, draw near and give your attention. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. This Honorable Court's now in session. Please come to order. Thank you. Good morning. We have uh, two cases on the calendar this morning, and we'll take them in the order presented. Um, the first case is Overdrive Incorporated versus Open eBook Forum. Council. Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Andrew Fiorella. I represent the appellant Overdrive Inc. I'd like to reserve three to five minutes for rebuttal. Mm -hmm. Overdrive is before this court for a second time to save the EPUB digital publishing standard which is the most widely used independent ebook publishing format in the world, from IDPF's determination to dismantle itself, to surrender its 20 year nonprofit mission to promote digital books, and to give away the valuable EPUB spec to MIT or the Worldwide, uh, I'm sorry, the World Wide Web Consortium. W3C is a large, uh, unincorporated international group that came up with the HTML standard. In the year or so, maybe two years leading up to the transaction that we're uh, discussing in 2016, there was an irrational fervor at IDPF's board to complete this transaction at any cost. There were no alternatives seriously considered but to merge with or surrender to W3C. And the actions that have occurred in the months and years past show that that fervor has not subsided. But the member vote back in uh, October and early November of 2016 that approved that transaction was both procedurally and substantively flawed in ways that require that it be, that it be held again. First, the procedural problems. Dissenting voices, including overdrives, were actively suppressed, not just difficult, but actively interfered with. IDPF's board president thought that any opposition to this transaction was wrongheaded. And those, and that's not my word, that's not advocacy, that was what uh, Mr. Conboy, who's the uh, board chairman, testified to under oath. Can you just specify how, I mean, because you use this word a lot in hmm. your brief, that it was actively impeded. In what manner was overdrive actively impeded? There's, say, three principal ways. Number one, to the extent that Overdrive was required under subsection C of 2940122 to contact the members. Overdrive asked for the email addresses for the primary representatives of the 300 or so members of uh, IDPF and were told no, unless you waive your right to sue. I mean, I don't want to quibble. Normally, the way that I would phrase that would be not facilitated rather than actively impeded. Well, there's more. Okay. There's more. Uh, they also did not include discussions, serious discussions of additional transactions or alternative transactions, either at the board or in the material that uh, was presented uh, to the members. There was a, an unstated favoring of MIT and the not wanting to make things easy, which is the words again of, of uh, the board chairman of IDPF. We're talking about a 21 day window. Suddenly you announce uh, that you're going to have this vote. It's going to be open for 21 days. The statute really only contemplates, I think, contemplates uh, actions of the corporation, not of the membership vote. So you have this very short window to go in and uh, get contact, get your message out. And for a large amorphous organization like IDPF with all of these members, some are eligible to vote. I think saying we're not going to give you the, the email addresses, good luck with the mail, I think is active impeding, particularly because the bylaw provisions and the rest of the operations of the business, well, business of the nonprofit corporation were transacted by email. So this isn't as if we were saying, I want you to do something special for me. In, I, in, just, in, I would like to press you on that. Okay. A little bit. This question of whether not giving the email addresses of the primary representatives was really a uh, tremendous handicap and actively active impedance. Um, we're talking about so many big companies among the the group of three hundred companies that are members of this business, and 
by and large, we're talking about companies that the president of um, Overdrive has long been familiar with. He's been, he's been, he himself has been very active in the organization. How hard can it be to say to your people, okay, we got to contact these people, um, contact the general counsel's office of these companies or contact their uh, officers and um, communicate with them and tell them we need, uh, tell them this is what we want to do and we want to contact their primary representatives. No effort, it seems, was made to do that. And I just am skeptical about how hard it really would have been to do it. Um, if the general counsel's office of, say, Microsoft, uh, which was one of the members, yes. um, get, gets a, uh, a call like that, they know who the, the primary representative is, or they can find out in five minutes and um, direct the, the communication to the right person. In the absence of any showing that, it, that an attempt was made and that it was more difficult than I would imagine uh, in, in what I've just said, I, I don't see why we should assume that this was in any way an, an, uh, an impediment. Well, I think there's there's two problems, and I'm not going to answer your question by not answering your question, but I do think it presupposes that this was the exclusive remedy, which I think is one of the principal problems. Uh, I'm just responding to. No, the I understand. And I'm not going to I'm not going to go off. I, I want to actually answer your question. I don't think that. Well, there, again, there's still two problems. Problem number one is the one you mentioned. Apple, international companies, uh, some companies. To be clear, I mean, I, I think we have to concede, and I, I don't think it would be fair not to concede that Mr. Potash knew some of the people on some of these, some of the members. That doesn't count for all of them. And again, we're talking about in 21 days. Maybe it would have worked, but also remember there was no sense that this was going to happen. It was on, I think it was on October. I don't, it, it came somewhat out of the blue. There were discussions about it. Suddenly there's a, there's a discussion, there's a, a vote that has to happen in 21 days. I have to find all of these members which are listed on their website. Some are international, some are in Saudi Arabia, some are in uh, all, all over the world. And even if I do all of that, as you said, Judge Glickman, the, the, the next problem is how many of those people are eligible to vote? I think there were about 130 out of the 300 that were uh, actually dues paying members at that time. So at more than half of your effort to contact all of these forms, so assuming you dropped everything and called all of those folks, would have resulted in wasted effort. So it's not just as simple as, let's call up the general counsel's office of Apple, say, hey, we're from IDPF, or we're, we're trying to challenge this transaction from IDPF. Uh, we think there's a statute, even though no one's ever mentioned it to us before, that we have to do this, and here's how we're gonna do it. Again, no uh, no indication of the other, that uh, IDPF had to, I mean, they sent this stuff by email that's how they that's how they operated so i think in this in this set of circumstances particularly when we're talking about a fundamental transaction i think if it was i don't like this person to be the board chairman i don't like this policy we're talking about i think uh, there'd be a lot more resonance of the hey figure it out for yourself come to the meeting make your voice we're talking about dissolving the corporation and transferring this asset that an enormous number of publishers and libraries and schools rely on to receive digital books. Uh, and certainly the justifications that we've seen for the transaction are not, uh, have not borne themselves out, including- uh, Council Phil, can you step back? Uh, you, sure. you might have been temper, uh, sort of adverting to this briefly in part of your response to Judge Whitman's question. But can we step back and, and just put this in an analytical framework? I, 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 one question I have is, are you arguing that the there is kind of a free floating equitable authority independent of 29 nonprofit corporations act uh, for the court to have intervened and the uh, trial court ought to have understood that is that one of your points that is what i think perhaps our principal point with respect to uh the scope of 40122 uh the well he, that seems to me less a point about, it depends what you mean by scope, I guess. That's less a point about how to interpret subsection C, for example, and more just the question of whether the remedy provided there, you know, the, the, the cause of action provided there is exclusive or whether there is some independent authority of courts, even if the requirements of 29 uh, aren't met to step in anyway. Right. And I, I think and arguing, Am I right though? You, you are arguing, one of your contentions is, in this court is, 
it doesn't matter how to interpret 29.401.22's specific provisions, even if it doesn't apply, there is kind of a free-floating equitable authority for the, for the court to intervene and the trial court misunderstood that. Am absolutely. I right? That's one of your arguments. I think I, that's absolutely it. And I, and I can point to two places where that I think that comes in. Most notably, it's 29.701.02 uh, of the nonprofit code that says the principles of law and equity shall supplement these provisions. Uh, and I also look to the previous decision of this court that said there's an independent basis under 11 uh, 921 for and what, 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 with respect to prior decisions of this court, are you referring to the Levant case or what are you no, referring to? The prior decision in the, the first oh, time in this before case. this court. Yeah, yeah, that was about whether there is, you know, jurisdiction. It seemed less about whether uh, in light of 29.401.22, there is a separate, you know, there's a cause of action. Um, so I'm not sure that our earlier decision answers the question. Assume for a moment that our earlier decision doesn't answer the question. I get the statutory provision that you're referring to. Um, uh, I, I thought you were also relying on our decision in Levant as supporting the idea that there is this kind of residual equitable authority independent of the statute. Yes, I think Levant uh, mentioned, I think Levant presents that in uh, sort of in action. But yes, I, I think the, the there's no reason to, if, if I, I don't mean to differ, but I, I do think the idea that I know that the, that the previous decision here talked about stripping jurisdiction, but I think it's the same idea. If you don't read 401.22a or c as stripping the court of anything, of any other jurisdiction, there would have to be residual equitable jurisdiction, just like when I walk in with a, contra a regular contract, just a normal- That's, that's, that's just not quite right, counsel. I mean, the jurisdiction might be just to say, well, you're wrong. I have jurisdiction over this case, but I have jurisdiction to enforce the Articles of Incorporation or bylaws, and that's all 401.22 lets me do. This is me acting as a trial court judge. Sure. And so, yes, I have jurisdiction, but the kind of claim that you're bringing is dead in the water because you're not asking me to enforce the Articles of Incorporation or bylaws. You're bringing some different type of claim. Um, and that's, that's, that's different from a jurisdictional argument. It's one thing to say, I don't have jurisdiction to decide this. And it's quite another to say, I have jurisdiction to decide this and you're dead in the water. I agree with, uh, obviously that's correct. I don't think that's what the interplay of these two provisions says. If there's nothing, for example, in 401.22a that says you can't get, for example, an injunction, which is one of the things we've asked for, a permanent injunction about, count, about completing the transaction as written. If that were the case, I mean, certainly the legislature can do what, what, it, what it wishes with the, uh, within reason uh, to that code. It doesn't say, if you want to challenge a, an action of the corporation, this is the only way you can, you can do it. You can't consider a, a declaratory judgment. You can't consider anything. This says a, you may challenge, may hearing determine the validity of the corporate action. I'm not sure I follow the point you're making now. Um, assume for a moment the 29.401.22 is the exclusive way other than a derivative action. I mean, there's also a derivative action that is authorized by statute. Yes. But assume that it, it, that and the derivative action are the exclusive ways in which one can challenge uh, the action of a uh, uh, nonprofit corporation. Well, A tells you you can challenge it. It doesn't really tell you what remedies are available. And probably, you, you know, you would look to, you know, there might well be declaratory relief, injunctive relief, whatever remedies are appropriate. It just tells you it basically creates a cause of action. Um, now it does say the Superior Court may hear, so it has, it has some jurisdiction sounding language in it, but uh, so it seems to confer some jurisdiction. I don't know if it strips any, um, but I don't, I, the points you're making about the declaratory or injunctive relief, those, uh, th those would all be available uh, in an appropriate case, even if 401.22 and the, uh, and the separate statutory provision for derivative actions were the only ways one could establish an entitlement to relief. So it, I, I'm not following your point about remedies. I think that the best way to read, even if you limit the cause of action that you can bring, I understand the derivative point, but if, if you consider the contested corporate action portion of this to be sort of if you're in here, you then get the panoply of remedies that are available in equity. I, I, I certainly think you can read it that way, but then we're, we're stuck with the problem of, is this, is C invoked properly in this particular case? So that's, that's, that's a particular part. And that's, I think that's our second and fourth 
uh, points of, 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 of error. But I, I do not read the, I think it's difficult. I suppose you could read 10702 uh, to be the remedies. We're, we're bringing the equitable remedies into this code statute. I consider it to be separate. Uh, and I think that the 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 general equity jurisprudence of uh, of the the court is a more powerful way or a more correct way of reading what this is. So in other well, words, I, I, it isn't the natural way to read it to say that um, shareholders or, or members, uh, among other people, uh, do have a remedy under A, but that remedy is available. A remedy of going to court, but that remedy is not available if um, there is an alternative non-court um, um, uh, remedy available to resolve the matter. And it's sort of, C is sort of similar in a way to the requirements for a derivative action, isn't it? You can't go to court and bring a derivative action, um, typically, unless you first made a demand and uh, on the board and you understand the various requirements that uh, have to be satisfied. And if you haven't done those things for a derivative action, well, the action is there, but you can't take advantage of it. Um, you don't have that that remedy. And isn't that what um, is what the statute is trying to do with A and C? You have this remedy, but there's a precondition. If there, if there is a, an available alternative remedy, then you have to pursue it or show it, and 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 that's your and that's your remedy. You have to, and you're not going to be able to succeed. If um, if you haven't pursued it, unless you're able to show us that it would have been perhaps futile, uh, or 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 you were impeded, which I don't think, which gets us back to that impediment question. But I don't see that as that is inconsistent with our prior decision on jurisdiction, and um, I, I, I don't know why we shouldn't say that um, that, that your 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 efforts are essentially precluded by C. Unless you, unless in response to Judge McLeese's question, you you, you have, an, have a satisfactory argument that wholly outside of this provision and the derivative provision, there's some other statutory basis for proceeding uh, going forward. I find that problematic because it would run into the question of, well, what does C accomplish? Uh, what, or what do A and C accomplish together if you don't have to you know, go that route at all? But I think what's important about that, and, and forgive me if I've interrupted you, I think that the- No, you haven't. <laughs> I, I, there, there was a lot in that, but, but the, um, in the derivative context, I think it's the unwillingness in, in a sort of financial transaction way for the courts to overwhelm or to be overwhelmed with, I don't like this acquisition, I don't like that acquisition. Well, I, I see the analogy, I think it breaks down a little bit in the, in the uh, not-for-profit context, particularly in these large organizations like this, where the supervisory power uh, of the court should not be so circumscribed. And if it is circumscribed, that's fine. Everyone knows the derivative rule, right? I mean, at least every, all, the, all, all civil practitioners that work in that space know the perils of either making the demand not making the demand, demand being excused as futile, how you show that, all those sorts of things. In this case, uh, there was no indication anywhere, either in the statute, but prior to uh, 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 IDPF bringing this up at the, uh, I, for the first time, really at the uh, preliminary injunction hearing, that this was the exclusive way we're going to review this. I think it'd be perfectly fair in a, for a corporation to, or for a nonprofit corporation to say, look, we don't want this before any uh, before the superior court period, barring you know sort of extraordinary fraud or or that sort of thing, uh, which this is pretty close to. It's not it's not that. I mean, I'm not going to overplay what this is. This is a terrible decision uh, by IDPF, and it's proven to be terrible over, over time. But the importance uh, of that supervisory jurisdiction, I think, is different in the nonprofit context than it is here. And the last thing I want to say, because I know I'm so, over before you on that point, do you think the business judgment rule does not apply? To the actions of the board of directors in a nonprofit situation. Absolutely, I think that it that would be profoundly dangerous to apply the. Uh, I mean, perhaps in the context where there's individual liability at stake, I think you could argue the business judgment rule applies. Uh, I do not think. First of all, the, the the superior court's decision wasn't really based on the business judgment rule. It mentions it, and I think IDPF relies on it more than than certainly the court did. But I think at that point, you you really can't square. Uh, the, the action that's available in, in A with the business judgment rule. It, I suppose, again, in a personal defense, we're suing Mr. Conboy 
Personal liability, I think that is a fair application of the business judgment rule, although I don't, no court has so held. Uh, I think the Armenian Assembly case was odd in that it, it involved personal liability, but also personal profit. And, and in that case, they found the business judgment rule didn't apply for the reasons that they said. So I, I, I answer your question that I do not think the business judgment rule should or does apply in these nonprofit decisions. And again, I'm, I'm over, so I don't want to. Uh, so go ahead. You wanted to say there was something I, I want to give you the chance to finish the thought that you were about to express. Um, I know I think I think I've covered what it is that uh, at least with respect to that I don't think I, think I guess the last thing I'll say is that this really is a dangerous slippery slope here for the court to to read too much into subsection C. If prospectively we want to have a, a world where these sort of provisions can uh, divest the, the court of, of uh, the spirit court of enforcement power or jurisdiction or however way we want to say it or circumscribe the, all remedies that are available under the uh, under the nonprofit code I think we need to make that a little more express and something that's certainly uh, a a member of one of these organizations should have some notice that it's going to and, and in this case I, I just don't think that that's uh, that certainly didn't happen before, in, before you sit down I realize that we, we you didn't get the chance to finish one other thing you were saying, and I want to ask you about it. Okay. Uh, when we asked you about the impediments that, how, when, when, we, when you were asked how uh, uh, the board of directors of, um, I, I always get the letters wrong, so I won't try. The board of directors of your adversary um, uh, actively impeded um, the, the opportunity to, to um, approach the members. You, you said there were three ways. And my notes indicate you gave us two. One was the refusal to give the email addresses of the primary representatives. Another was um, uh, uh, the claim that uh, they did not include a serious discussion of the alternatives uh, and information about the alternatives, I guess, to the, to the members. Was the third um, thing, uh, was the third uh, active impediment the 21 day window that was operative or did you have an additional uh, impediment impediment in mind? I, well, given the chance and thank you. Uh, the I do think the 21 day window and the way, in other words, this wasn't a discussion that they were having. And finally, we, you know, six months ago, we knew we were gonna have these meetings. We were gonna discuss it. It was something we were on the table. It sort of percolated around and then boom, all of a sudden we're gonna, we're gonna merge. And then we have to mobilize opposition find the, the right members, gather the right support and do everything in 21 days. That's absolutely an impediment. The timing of how this all went and that the only public meeting they had for this was in Spain, which for an international organization is fine, but most of the members, many of the members are or were uh, US members. I also don't wanna, before I go, but the, the other point, I, I wanna make sure I get this point about changing the deal afterwards, uh, but th there was a favoring of MIT, sort of a tipping of the, the table in, in, uh, in favor of MIT that was not really disclosed. They said it was the best alternative, but they didn't say that all other transactions were gonna have to come up with a higher hurdle than what MIT offered uh, because they felt that there was some competition coming from MIT. Uh, that turned out to be well, it was irrational at the time, and it turned out to be irrational in retrospect, given what's happened. But the last thing I want to leave the court with before I, before I go on, and I really do appreciate the extra time, uh, the nature of this transaction has changed substantially uh, in, since the closing. Uh, the dis dissolution of, I of IDPF and the transfer of EPUB to W3C was what the transaction was represented. Given the copyright infirmaries, uh, infirmities to the uh, transaction that were completely ignored during the uh, initial uh, 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 disclosure of the of the transaction. IDPF is going to have to stay alive forever or face another copyright infringement lawsuit. They can't actively under the copyright law transfer this. IDPF itself in its brief in, at page 29 admits that if the transaction changes, there has to be another vote. I almost think some of this is rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. The, the important things are the jurisdictional things as far as the jurisprudence of the court, but this individual transaction, I don't think there's any debate that there, there should be another vote. Uh, can, I, can I just ask one question before you, um, and you can feel free to answer this on rebuttal because it's about the record. Um, so when I look at your amended petition and the summary judgment pleadings, what I see is you're invoking the court's authority under 401.22. Um, at no point do I see, but tell me if I'm wrong, 
Um, do I see you raising Levant or sort of a free-floating equity power that would trump 40122C's restrictions, which um, appellees had raised below? And so the trial court doesn't get into it in its summary judgment ruling, so far as I recall. If you think you've raised before the trial court that there is some free-floating equity power that trumps the restrictions that otherwise the trial court thought existed in 40122. Um, if you could point me to where you made that argument, that would be helpful for me. And like I said, if you don't, if you're not prepared to do it on, on your feet, um, if you have any response and rebuttal, that would be just as good. Uh, yes, I think it was a re reference to the relief that we sought in the original or in the amended petition, but uh, I will take the opportunity to, to review that quickly uh, and, and get back to the court at, at rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Thank you, Mr. Ross. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. My name is David Ross, counsel for Appelli, the Open eBook Forum, doing business as International Digital Publishing Forum, or IDPF. Your Honors, Overdrive is trying to fight a war that it already won. That is, they're trying to refight the battle that was brought before this court a few years ago. And the appellant is correct that the court previously reversed the dismissal based on DC code section 29-401.22C. But the devil is in the details. This case before the court today is not about Section 11-921A, or subject matter jurisdiction. It actually fits within the framework of the previous decision. In the previous decision, this court stated that 29-401.22C circumscribes the cause of action set forth in subsection A. Judge Lopez here apparently took that direction to heart, and he exercised jurisdiction. Discovery was taken. Summary judgment was based on a record. And the judge correctly stated that subsection C circumscribes subsection A, where number one, the bylaws provide a means of resolving a challenge to a corporate action, and two, the challenged actions comply with the corporations, articles, and bylaws. The judge was also correct in finding that the bylaws in this case provided a means of resolving a challenge. Is there some implication? Oh, go ahead, Judge McLeese. Just on the question of what the language means of resolving a challenge to corporate action can be understood to mean. Um, imagine, this is a hypothetical to see how far you take it. Imagine that there was no rescission in the articles or bylaws. And instead there's a provision that said, if you don't like a decision that the board makes, you can write a letter to the board explaining your reasons and the board, if it wishes, can change its mind. Would you say that that was a means of resolving a challenge to corporate action in the bylaws or articles and therefore that it would foreclose any cause of action under uh, uh, 29, any relief under 2940122? Or would you think that wouldn't be enough of a means of resolving a challenge to corporate action? Okay, Your Honor. Um, that obviously is not the situation here. I think it's a, maybe a closer question whether it actually is a means, whether it is possible to resolve the challenge that way. Right, I'm interested that could in be, that could be illusory. Would, would, yeah, that could, right. that could be illusory in that circumstance, but not and, here. And, well, no, I, I'm just trying to figure out, do you think, I'm, just try, I'm trying to figure out what your legal theory is. And it, it, right. it sounds as though you're acknowledging the possibility that uh, articles uh, or bylaws could lay out some way of uh, further consideration of a decision by the nonprofit corporation. But if they, if that way was illusory or sufficiently ineffective, it wouldn't count as a means of resolving a challenge to corporate action. Is that a fair way of understanding? 
and in your response to my question that you think that's at least possibly correct, but you're not necessarily taking a position? Or? Oh, I think there's a very good possibility that it's correct that it could be an illusory promise under contract law, which contract law is what applies to bylaws. Um, an illusory promise is an illusory promise, but this is not this in this particular circumstance well, is not. Yeah, an illusory I don't promise. see why that would be an illusory promise, and you might be held to good faith. You know, it's possible that the covenant of good faith and fair dealing would require that the you know the the the, the uh, board actually you know meet again and consider the point and reach a further decision. So I don't know that it'd be an illusory promise. It's just that it wouldn't be a very effective way of of trying of trying to prevent the corporation from doing something that uh, one or more of its members thinks is uh, unlawful or imprudent or uh, you know fraudulent or pick your pick your unpleasant term. Right. Okay. Uh, I I understand. I think I understand the question, Your Honor. The statute requires a means, not an effective means, not a reasonable means, not the best means, but a means. And it has to be a real means. Um, perhaps that in that hypothetical, it is a real means, even though it is possible that nothing will get uh, get changed. This is analogous to contractual provisions where one party is given sole discretion to make certain decisions. And the hypothetical that you gave. And those types of contractual provisions tend to be enforceable if the parties had an arm's length transaction. And in such a case, if someone's given sole discretion, then the decision need not be fair, need not be reasonable, need, need not be, be the best. We respectfully contend in this particular case, this was effective, this was real, this was useful, and it could have been done effectively had Mr. Potash of Overdrive even tried to avail himself of the right. Uh, Mr. That's that one more abstract question. Um, I, I had asked your opponent whether it was part of your opponent's argument, at least in this court, that however one interprets the specific requirements of 29-401-22, that's just one horse that they have in the race. And they have another horse in the race, which is they can, and they did, well, they can, uh, ask the, the trial court to just intervene on general principles of equity and the kind of historic authority of uh, uh, courts to judicially supervise uh, charitable organizations. Um, do, do you understand, uh, did you understand that argument to be raised in this court? And do you have a response to the question that Judge Deal was asking about whether it was raised in the trial court? I don't recall it being raised in the trial court. Uh, my answer, my answer though, to that argument would be maybe there were other avenues, but they didn't seek them. Overdrive sought relief under 29-401.22C. Didn't state a cause of action or attempt to cause the state a cause of action under 29-403.04 or 412.20. Um, 29-412.20 actually enables the court to provide injunctive or equitable relief where, among other things, the directors have acted in a manner that is illegal, oppressive, or fraudulent. That cause of action was never stated. They never attempted to state that cause of action. They're trying to make this argument that because the court has general equitable power, that whether authorized by a specific statute or not, it could just exercise that jurisdiction. It has jurisdiction, but it has jurisdiction to apply the laws that are brought before it. And so this is something, this is something that was not part of the case. It's not in the uh, petition. It's not in the amended petition. There, there was a, and I say this respectfully to opposing counsel who I, I genuinely respect, but there was a sort of a hodgepodge of new arguments brought in at summary judgment. Uh, none of those statutes to my recollection was, cite, uh, was cited, but there were arguments made regarding, regarding jurisdiction. And I think this, uh, this new jurisdictional argument, 
I think was really brought not, if I recall correctly, not in response to summary judgment, but just at this appellate level. Mr. Ross, I understood you to say earlier, getting back to, to a point you were about to make, um, I understood you to say that even if sub, even if paragraph C is applicable here, even, even if we were to say there, there was another means to resolve it and therefore um, subsection A shall not apply. Nonetheless, uh, um, overdrive can still raise a question of whether the challenged action complied with or was precluded by the Articles of Incorporation. Absolutely. Um, and I'm, uh, and I guess I have, if, if that's true, that seems like a significant limitation on C. That's my, my comment. But it raises, I think, two questions in my mind. First of all, I take it that that means the court still has to decide such a question as whether um, the transaction is, be, whether the, um, the other party in the transaction is engaged in substantially similar um, uh, activities as IDPF. Yes, sir. But it, it, it's a question I wanted to focus on for the second reason that, that the second question I have in my mind, which is I, I, did, I did have somewhat the impression that if we found that if subparagraph that that if subparagraph C applies, we did not have to reach that question, because that would be a question that 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 overdrive could not present under in an action brought under paragraph A. Why is it we have to reach or should reach? I realize I'm asking you a question. Why don't we do something even more favorable to, for for your party than you asked for? But Right. But you brought it up. So <laughs> why is it um, we uh, ha why is it you interpret C even when it's applicable as not um, throwing overdrive out of court on the um, for example, the, the substantial uh, substantial su substantially similar issue? Uh, the reason I had not interpreted that way was that I read C to say that C applies if these other circumstances are met. And if one is enforcing the articles or the bylaws, they will see that the bylaws and the articles actually were complied with in this particular case. Well, I understand you think that on the merits you prevail on that question, but right. but, uh, but um, I, I, I mean, it, I thought that Overdrive is bringing a number of objections to the, a number of challenges. Um, not all of them are this is violent about the, you know, of the articles, I suppose. But at least one is, for example, the the, the, the that that the the the, um, the claim that the articles prohibit um, this transaction because MIT is not substantially is not engaged in a substantially similar activity. Um, <laughs> but I would have thought, well, that's their claim under A, but they have a, mes a method of resolving it. They go to the members and they say to the members, look, the board is not the final authority you are, and you should, you should override the board on this question. And I, I would think the, the members could, be, be, could find the challenge on, you know, under the articles meritorious and, agree with overdrive. Uh, so, so it's not an illusory method of resolving the, the question. So I'm wondering why we, why if this court agrees with you and, and Mr. Uh, Fiorella may well have answers to this too. If this court agrees with you on the, on the, the meaning of subparagraph C uh, and doesn't find any other um, uh, basis for the court to exercise authority here, injunctive relief or otherwise. Um, why we ever get to the question of the interpretation of the articles? Yeah, I, I, I do see your point, Your Honor. There was not a there was not a particular claim, um, a claim itself based on violation of the articles or violation of the bylaws. 
Overdrive did that as part of their analysis under subsection A. So yes, Your Honor, I agree with you that we need not get to it if there is a means of resolving it here and not a separate. Now there's one that. final question that I have to ask you. At the end of paragraph C, there is that proviso, which reads uh, that even when, even when paragraph C applies, but the superior court may enforce the articles or bylaws if appropriate. Uh, now I don't know that um, I don't know that uh, Overdrive has really relied on that proviso. But how do you understand what that means? I understood that to mean, for example, if an action, regardless of whether there is a means of challenging violates the bylaws or articles, then a challenge can be made under the articles or bylaws. And that this would not preclude that direct challenge under the bylaws or, or articles. So you read that as, as in effect the answer to my question about why we get to the, the question of compliance with the articles. Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. Can I ask you if, if the issue is, uh, uh, Assuming we do have to get to that question, uh, the trial court granted summary judgment on it in effect, I guess. So the conclusion would be that no reasonable fact finder could conclude that these two organizations were not substantially similar in their activities. Is that, the, is that, is that what it would have to be in order for that ruling to be correct? I didn't read it quite that way, Your Honor. I, I think there is there's a distinction between substantially similar organizations and well, yeah, organizations I, I, that engage. I, I definitely spoke imprecisely. It, it, the, the, the language in the Articles of Incorporation is that the organization has to engage in activities substantially similar to those of IPDF. So it's the activities have to be substantially similar. But my question is less about the exact wording of that um, but you're quite right that uh, my wording was imprecise. And more about, is it correct that for the trial court, if that's a, a, a point that could be a basis for relief, um, independent of whether there was a means of challenging the transaction, um, for the trial court to have uh, granted summary judgment on the point, the trial court would have to have concluded, and we would have to agree if we were going to affirm the trial court, that no reasonable fact finder could view the activities of uh, IDPF and MIT3WC, maybe, uh, uh, as not substantially similar. Um, I would get a little more specific than that. Engaging in substantially similar activities is different than engaging only in substantially similar activities. And I would draw an analogy here uh, to the Walmart Toys R Us situation. My understanding is that Walmart effectively put Toys R Us out of business because it sold toys so well that Toys R Us could not compete. So Walmart's, Walmart did a lot of other things too, but its toy department was substantially similar to what Toys R Us was doing. And that is a situation here with W3C and MIT. Yes, W3C does a lot of stuff, but W3C also does digital publishing. It's very attached to digital publishing. Not only was it doing it beforehand, but it has agreed that it will continue to do so. And if it but does do not do it, you agree? Oh. I'm sorry, did you agree with Judge no. McLeese? The question for us, uh, that the question for us is, um, could no reasonable juror, uh, jury conclude otherwise? Yes. Okay. And I do see I'm out of, and out of time. So thank you, Your can, Honors. Can I, can I just ask one thing? Because I sure. have to give you a hard time about something. Um, sure. The, the dissolution, point bothers me a little bit. Um, on what, I, if I remember correctly, the agreement that was approved by the membership contemplated dissolution originally in 2017, um, and then it was punted in 2018. And now it just sort of looks like a thing that's going to be punted in perpetuity 
to get out of some potential copyright liability. I don't know. Um, can you explain to me how that isn't a significant change to what was approved by IDPF's membership? Sure, Your Honor. Because the members' rights are effectively the same as they would have been, there's a situation that Overdrive created that they're now trying to profit from by preventing this thing from, from, ever, um, from ever being consummated or from being consummated within a reasonable amount of time. But this was, what was done was actually consistent with what was stated in the plan of membership exchange that was approved by the membership, stating that minor and non-material changes could be made. Now, it's certainly material to overdrive, and there might be people who approved the merger agreement who feel likewise, that they want to be able to have their day in court on a copyright infringement claim, independent of whatever license they gave to IDPF. Um, so I, I guess I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if they've got a leg to stand on in their copyright claim. Um, but I do know that the Sixth Circuit and the district court out there shut it down on the basis that this is just kind of a license uh, that, or, that IDPF is free to share unless and until it dissolves. Right. And it seems to me that the right to litigate that is a pretty substantial change to the membership. Uh, if, if, you know, even if nothing underlies it, the right to figure out and have a day in court matters a little bit. That strikes me as, as a material change. But well, not the, you. the change was not obviously initiated by IDPF itself. IDPF was sued. And IDPF is defending the suit that Overdrive brought. So that was not a change brought on by IDPF. The only change brought on by IDPF was an interim licensing arrangement that could enable the IDPF members or former members to enjoy the benefits of W3C that they, that they voted to approve otherwise. Mr. Ross, may I ask you a follow-up question? Sure, you're um, If IDPF has not yet uh, dissolved and its dissolution is not, you know, in, in the immediate offing, do I understand correctly, that means it still exists, it still has a board of directors, it still has members, it still has articles of incorporation and the rest? It still has a board of directors. Um, it's still has articles, it still exists really at this point for purposes of defending these litigations. And well, you see, I was wondering, the thought occurred to me as you were speaking, what stops um, Overdrive now as a member of this continuing entity from, uh, for example, I mean, maybe there are other remedies, but for example, contacting all uh, its members, um, contacting the primary representatives of them or whoever whoever it is who votes on behalf of those members and continuing to seek through that means to undo or correct this transaction I suppose it could I suppose it could do so um, I suppose it could do so uh, and, and that bring that raises because I take it your position is that that IDPF does not have to go back to the members itself because of the uh, right. change. I understand that's your position, but right, it was okay. a non-material change, and I suppose yeah. that I suppose that and maybe <laughs> that overdrive. I suppose right. that overdrive could do that. I suppose, <laughs> and without without wanting to bind myself, I suppose that they could do that because I would need to look in, into this okay. in a little more depth. And um, are they members of good standing? I mean, is, is or is IP is IDPF kind of only nominally existent and they don't have any members of good standing anymore and nobody's paying dues and so nobody really can vote on anything or is that all very murky? It's nominally in existence right now. And my understanding is that it is not accepting, uh, accepting dues at this point. But that would mean, that's sort of interesting, just playing this out. That would mean that the uh, remedy available in C is no longer available to the members, and so uh, it might tr it might trigger the applicability of A. They might have to bring a new suit because they didn't really. This is not what they pled in this one, but um, 
and that my and bringing a new suit might have other problems for them. I understand there might be other obstacles, but uh, well, interesting. All right, I just wondered as wondered about the effects of this non-dissolution and what it, what the consequences are. Okay. Um, uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Your Honors. Mr. Friarella, we'll give you a few minutes. Thanks. I I, I wanted to start by answering uh, Judge Deal's question. Um, we raised it in, in a number of places, the meaning the free floating jurisdiction. While there isn't a section where we expressly say, hey, and by the way, you have free floating jurisdiction to, to uh, apply equity jurisdiction. The motion was brought pursuant to the, the summary judgment rule, but also rule 56 and 57, uh, which uh, apply here. And there at page 17 through 19, we talk about the standards for the I'm sorry, just just because I, I want to look at this at 17 sure. through 19 of the motion for summary judgment. Well, I'm sorry, in the actual sure. the actual motion itself, which is at a, uh, it's in the appellate record at 719, we invoke the uh, other rules. In fact, we don't even in the motion talk about uh, 401.22. And in the brief, it's at page 17 and 19 of the brief, where we talk about the standards for the equitable relief. And I, I also note that in the last page of the brief where we, in the conclusion, we talk about the uh, granting all the relief asked for in the complaint. And I think that's relevant because the first count of the complaint is a permanent injunction that was bought pursuant to rule 65, not any of the statutory bases. And in there, among other basis for relief, we talk about, I know we mentioned the, uh, the conflict in the uh, substantially similar, that's expressly pleaded in there. Uh, but I, I have to concede, just to be to be honest with the court, I, I, I we did not separately analyze the uh, the injunction standards and the the uh, declaratory judgment standard. Uh, uh, that that is actually a fair criticism. Uh, an important point that follows up in the last question that that was asked of Mr. Ross: there are no more members. Uh, one of the first things that happened once the approval occurred was that the uh, membership disappeared. And I think Mr. Ross uh, did, did say that, but I wanted to emphasize that point. There is no more, as of, I think it was January of 2017 or thereabouts, early in 2017, the, um, the members ceased to exist. We brought our suit before then, so I don't think there's any sort of divestiture of, 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 of rights problem, uh, but there is sort of a, a circular conundrum here. I think it's extraordinarily important that, that Mr. Ross, whom I also respect, and I think has done a wonderful job in this case, um, he did say something, though, that, that I think kind of encapsulates our point about C. He said, a means of, of challenging doesn't have to be an effective means. And, and I think that's, that is IDPF's position. Uh, I think that's fair to say. I think that that's part of the problem here, is that um, you can say, you can't bring it to court. We're going to do this. Uh, we're going to make it impossible for you practically to contact the board. We're going to give you this little, or the members are going to give you this little tiny window to do it in, and eh, close enough. You can't. I understood. Uh, I understood him to be distinguishing an effective means from a real means. The, the distinction being along the lines of, um, it doesn't mean that uh, it, there's no guarantee this means is going to work for you, but it, it just has to give you a sort of a fair shot. Yeah, so but, well, but that's that's exactly it. I'm sorry, and I didn't mean to misstate Mr. Ross's words because, again, I, I do have I do have a great deal of respect for him. Uh, Can I ask Mr. Fiorello, let me just ask yes, you, just to try understand. I understand you're to a degree taking issue with your opponent's interpretation of what that means, but I want to make sure I understand your own. Imagine that what had happened here was that the bylaws uh, or articles said, uh, if the board makes a decision and members don't like it. Uh, any member can, um, you know, call for a vote, and the member will be provided with the name, the email addresses of the, you know, uh, contact people. I forget the terminology for that, uh, um, and uh, they will be given an opportunity in advance of the meeting to disseminate to those people all the material that they think is appropriate for the, that membership to consider in deciding whether or not to rescind the decision of the board of directors. And uh, those, and if a majority of the members think that the board of uh, directors decision is uh, 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 invalid, inappropriate, unwise, they can over, they can rescind it. And imagine all of those bylaws were, were followed. 
would you think that the requirements of C had met? There were, a, you know, the bylaws provided for a, you know, a reasonably effective means of challenging a corporate action, and those were followed. And then, let's say the boat, you know, the boat, the boat was 80, 20 not to rescind. Would you think then that uh, if all that had been the case, do you think that uh, overdrive though? disgruntled about the outcome of the decision would have no action under uh, 29-401-22A because the bylaws had provided a means of resolving a challenge to a corporate action. We would certainly not have an action. Uh, I think you're right. And I also think it wouldn't even have to go to that. That's obviously, you know, sort of the perfect, the Boy Scout way of of doing it. I don't even think they had to go to that length. If, if on the day after the announcement had been made when Mr. Potash contacted Mr. Kirscher and said, hey, could you give us the names? If he had just given the names, he didn't have to do anything else. Just given us the, the, the contact information, I think we would have been making a different case. To be clear, the, 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 what I want to make sure I understand that is you're not, you don't think that means of resolving a challenge refers to some sort of like arbitration or external to the corporation. As long as it's sufficiently reasonably effective in your view, the means can be entirely internal to the corporation. And I might even be more conservative in saying if you don't impede or make it more difficult than you need to, if there's a, some some fair shot, all we've ever wanted in this case was a fair shot to reach the the the, the decision makers at the at the people that actually can vote, right? Not just the sort of folks who've let it uh, disappointment with the organization sort of go. If if we knew who was able to vote and we were able to contact them in a reasonable way, uh, 21 days is fine, right? Would have been fine because he, Mr. Potash, didn't sit on his his. Uh, on his chair waiting for this to happen, he contacted them immediately. Uh, and then we, we brought suit to stop the, the case, or to stop the vote. Uh, so, uh, right, I'm not, I'm not trying to imply or, or, or read into the statute some enormous burdensome thing for, for corporations to, uh, to do. In fact, I think in this case, if they had done even the tiniest bit, uh, they would have probably satisfied that and we would have had a much more difficult argument. Um, the final thing I want to address about Mr. Ross's argument was that this content, this notion that we created the uh, copyright problem, that is, that, that isn't correct. Um, the IP policy. Think, I'm sorry, before you get to copyright, can I, start, yeah. I have one follow up on your answer there, which is, you know, they did say, hey, we'll give you all that. We'll in fact, give you email addresses uh, and all the personal representative names. Just don't do, just don't take us to court over this. And now you're saying, well, if they had done all of that, we wouldn't have had a case in court. Um, that seems a little problematic for your position that they were willing to do all the things that you think would have eviscerated your case, if only you had bypassed it. I think if we had been working within the, I mean, it's a, it's a fair point. I think if we've been working within the constructs of, of uh, 4122 and that everyone knew if you don't qualify, if you don't uh, fall into the, the bylaw provision, you're, you're done, right? If that had sort of been understood ahead of time, like uh, an arbitrary, I think someone, uh, one of the judges brought up uh, the idea of an arbitration clause. Okay. So if you know, you have to arbitrate going to court is, is, is wrong. You get, you, you get your attorney's fees awarded. You're supposed to go to arbitration, right? That's, that's, that's how that works. No one, uh, no one considered that. And also if you're suspicious of a board and they're in they're, they're this entire deal, the idea that you say, sure, we'll give you the information that will permit you to challenge this transaction, but hey, don't, please don't sue us. That's quite a red flag. I would not have advised uh, any client to, to take them up on that unless there was some other means of, of protecting their interests. But I do understand, I do understand your point, Judge Deal. Um, I hope that was a satisfactory answer. It, it certainly is, although I, I just have, I'm, I'm sorry, I know I'm keeping you up. Um, no, it's fine. The one follow-up is, factually speaking, I just can't recall. When that request was made, um, am I right? Sort of a premise of your answer is, well, when we were requesting the contact information for the personal representatives, what was on our mind was not this rescission clause in the bylaws. Right. Um, is, is, that, is that correct? Is that That's right. Okay. It was the vote that was that was occurring at the time. We knew we had 21 days. We knew what the what they were what was at stake here. Again, uh, sort of a, I, I, I mean, it's hard to read a materiality provision into these uh, uh, code sections because they're not. It's not necessarily there. But this is a very important, obviously, a very important transaction. And no one, and, and at no time again until the litigation had we really even considered this provision. So all of that. The final thing I want to say was about this uh, about the the IP policy. The problem that caused their, the uh, copyright problem started 10 years or so, maybe more, uh, almost 20 years before we, this all, these events actually occurred. 
there's an IP policy that says the members own their contributions to EPUB. It's, it's, it's their policy. It's not, it's not overdrafts. When they made the presentation to the board, to the, um, the members, they said, you don't own anything. You don't own any of our assets. You don't own any part of it. You don't own anything. We're going to transfer everything to, to, to W3C and we're going to dissolve. That turned out not to be tr to be correct, and I, I don't read any bad faith into it. I just don't think I think that the board was negligent in not considering that they'd had this problem, which they knew about for years, and didn't resolve prior to this transaction. And I thank you so much both for the extended time and for the courtesy of uh, of uh, uh, the, the argument today. Very much appreciate it. Thank you, Your Honors. John Folk, thank you. Uh, the case is uh, submitted, and you may log off. Thank you. Thank you. We'll call the uh, second case on the calendar, uh, Tanya Butler Truesdale versus District of Columbia Department of Human Resources. Oh. Okay, um, Ms. Butler Truesdale, you may proceed. Good morning, your honors. May it please the court, my name is Tanya Butler Truesdale. I am the pro se appellant, and I wish to reserve six minutes for rebuttal. Okay. This is a case about DC Department of Human Resources agency discretion as delineated by DC code section 2-510A, D and E, and the DC Comprehensive Merit Personnel Act or the CMPA, which is based on chapter 51 of Title V of the United States Code. The CMPA charges DCHR to one, provide a path to equitable and adequate compensation or equal pay for equal work where jobs have been misclassified and result in unequitable compensation and two, establish an impartial and comprehensive administrative process or negotiated procedures for resolving employee grievances. It is well settled that an agency's interpretation of a statute is binding on the court unless it conflicts with the plain meaning of the statute or its legislative history. <clears throat> This is reiterated in Superior Beverages versus District of Columbia Alcohol Beverage Control Board in 1989 case, which stated that a court should defer to any reasonable construction of, statute, of a statute by an agency. In this matter, however, it can be said that DCHR's failure to make findings of fact related to a comparison of my duties to the po position classification standard for a general attorney, that is the GS 905 legal series, conflicts with the plain meaning of the DC CMPA. No aspect of the DC CMPA can be interpreted as supporting the issuance of a position classification review and classification appeal decision absent relevant findings of fact and rationale and rational conclusions based on the record. I don't, I don't think Ms. Butler Truesdale, I don't think there's a disagreement about that. Um, I mean, I don't think there's a disagreement about the legal principle that this needs to be substantially supported in the record, um, the agency's finding. The question is really whether it is. So, you know, maybe, maybe it would I'm be helpful. I'm Your Honor. <laughs> right, oh, I, okay. Okay. I, maybe I was just rushing you there. <laughs> I'm right around the corner. Right. Good enough. <laughs> okay. In Jones v. DC Employment Services, this court stated that it must know the reasons that underlie the agency decision. And there are 20 reasons why this decision is not supported by the record. Number Ms. one- Ms. Butler, before you get into all 20 of them, can I just focus your attention on one finding that the director did make and your reaction to whether 
that finding is supported by evidence in the record. So the um, director said that um, uh, referring to the position that you hold, that it did not, and this is a quote, entail the level of substantive legal work that are uh, um, typical of the LA 905 series. Um, so that was a finding. I mean, that's really, it, it, I, I guess maybe it's a mixed question of law or fact, but in part, it seems like it's a factual finding. It's got some factual components. That's a particular finding. Do you think there was evidence in the record to support that, or do you think there was not? I'm not certain that it is actually a factual finding, given that she did not rely on the position description to state that though that the duties it defined in my position description are not legal duties. She did not explain how it is that most of my duties fall within rule 49 would be the unauthorized practice of law if they were performed by anyone other than an attorney. Well, I take your point that the, there's not a lot of explanation there, but let me, let me, let me try it a, a different way. Was there any evidence in whatever record was created about how much substantive legal work is required in a typical LA 905 series? Like no. the, level, the, the level of substantive legal work, how much there is of that in a LA 905 series position? I don't know that I can adequately explain her decision other than that it seemed that she was relying on her assessment that attorneys must perf perform adjudication that I was not a trial attorney for the agency. This an error because DCHR, I'm sorry, DC Housing and Community Development, in fact, does not have any trial attorneys on their staff. They have a whole department of attorneys. However, they are transactional attorneys. And no one on in the 900 series in my agency adjudicates. I, it appears that her decision is based on the fact or, or heavily relying on the fact that she made, but she didn't even make enough finding that I don't adjudicate, you know? So I'm not really sure that that is a, an appropriate finding of fact or a finding- Ms. Butler, Ms. Butler Truesdale? The evidence in the record. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I thought you were yes. stopping, but let me, let me ask you, if we agree with you that um, the determination that uh, Judge McLeese quoted um, is uh, not adequately explained or justified, and that uh, and perhaps there is no substantive, uh, no substantial evidence in the record supporting it. What do you think uh, we ought to rule? What is the remedy that you think it is appropriate for us to to give? I believe that with respect to my duties as the rental property program specialist, that the decisions should be reversed. With respect to my duties as- But well, when you say reversed, you see, this is what I want to focus on. Uh -huh. uh, I, well, I'm putting aside, by the way, the ombudsman issue. Okay. We'll just put that aside. Um, uh, we'll come to that. Um, uh, it, when you say reversed, are you asking us to make a decision that um, essentially says uh, Ms. Butler Truesdale must be, must be uh, classified and compensated uh, in accordance with the 905 series. Uh, presumably, I think you probably mean 905.13, but let's not get into the weeds here. Um, uh, or, or, or do we send it back for further proceedings? Does the, uh, does the director get, uh, do, do we instruct the director to reconsider uh, I believe that you have a, a, a appropriate evidence in the record to support saying that I am performing the duties of a licensed attorney in the District of Columbia and that the rent administrator is relying on me to perform legal services based on the fact that the record indicates that the rent administrator who has the, in, as a statutory authority to delegate her responsibilities and hire legal counsel has in fact done so when she hired me and Keith Anderson, who are both barred in the District of Columbia and employ our skills uh, in our position descriptions, which read that we must- I'll tell, I'll tell you why I'm a little uncertain about this. Uh, uh, 
you know, this was a summary judgment ruling. And in effect, you're saying that in addition to reversing summary judgment for the, um, for the district, we should say that on this record, you were entitled to summary judgment. Uh, actually, um, the, it was, I asked for a, su a summary judgment and that was denied, but the, the, um, uh, in the, in the case below, uh, she made a ruling fully on the record. I don't know that she actually gave uh, DC HR a summary judgment. Oh, well. Denied my summary right, judgment. But, my well, motion uh, summary right, judgment. She actually, uh, right, what you're, what you're, right. I, I, I really did, I prefer Thank to speak you. there. But, <laughs> no worries. But, but what I meant was that uh, in addition to reversing the ruling for the district, you're asking us to enter a ruling, to order the trial judge to enter a ruling favorable to you. In effect, to grant, to grant your motion uh, to conclude the case with a, with, with a summary judgment ruling. I'm a little uncertain whether that's the appropriate thing to do or not. Uh, have you given a lot of thought to that? Your, your position is the evidence is so one-sided uh, yes, there is enough in the evidence in the record. That, there is enough that, that, evidence that, that the judge could only come to one conclusion. There is enough evidence in the record, given that the uh, DC House Community Development sends me to training at the DC Bar. They send me to ABA training, and they also include me on training at the office of the Attorney General. I, in fact, am chair of the administrative. Uh, section of the DC bar, which is, I mean, I am charged with knowing not just the Rental Housing Act, but construction law, administrative law, um, contract law, and real estate law. That's in my position description. If in fact, someone can do this position or they hired someone to do my position, who is not licensed in the District of Columbia, Rule 49 says they be engaging in the unauthorized practice of law. Well, I, I think that it may not follow inevitably from the idea that at least some of what you, your position requires you to do would require someone to be a lawyer, that the best job description is attorney advisor rather than something that isn't. It might depend a lot on what percentage of the work of the position was legal rather than non-legal, what the other classifications were and what the better fit was. So I'm not quite sure I'm following you. If, the, if your chain of reasoning is to do my job, you have to be a lawyer. Therefore, I have to be classified in a position that has the word attorney in it. I'm not sure that necessarily follows. It might depend on- well, uh, I'm sorry, I apologize. No problem. You I, I wanted to make sure that you're clear that DCHR did in fact properly classify one employee of the rental accommodation division in the 900 series. No, I understand. I understand there are a lot of other circumstances you rely on. I was just kind of reacting to one uh, kind of uh, line of thinking that you were seemed to be suggesting, which is really all we need to know in order to conclude that you're entitled to prevail outright is your job requires, in, involves activities that can only permissibly be done by a lawyer. Um, I, that's obviously relevant if accurate, um, but I, at times it seemed as though in your brief and today that you were saying really that by itself is enough. If once you know that, you know that your classification has to be attorney advisor. And that, that seems to me more complicated. And some of the other points you're making right now are also relevant to that for sure. Um, but I was just reacting to one line of thought that it seemed like you were uh, expressing. And, and I, I, I definitely can understand that Judge McLeese because you know I've actually had to attempt to master the relevant section of the OPM and the classification guys in such that I'm looking at it um, almost as if someone would if they were an employee of DCHR. As a matter of fact, I can't quite understand yet how it is that they could not classify me in the 900 series. The 300 series and the 1100 series that they make reference to do not align with my duties. 
And the instructions uh, issued by the OPM make specific reference to, in the 900 series, not diverting uh, employees out of that section just because some of their duties may fall in line in the 300 or 1100 series. That's deep in the weeds of some of the other classification guides. And I apologize that I'm skipping over and, and looping around. It's just that uh, I've spent three years rereading all of these, thi these things you know, in my spare time. So I apologize that I, I'm leaving gaps. Uh, let us, let us you, uh, you've reserved six minutes for uh, uh, your rebuttal and we'll give you that. Um, let us hear from counsel for the government okay. and see what they have to say about this and then we'll come back to you. Thank you so much, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Uh, Gurton. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. May it please the court. Jeremy Gurton for the District Appellees. Proper classification of a personnel position is a technical determination that ultimately requires an exercise of judgment by human resources experts. The question before this court is whether substantial evidence supports DCHR's judgment that a non-attorney classification in the career service accurately described Ms. Butler Truesdale's position of rental property program specialist. I don't think that's quite correct. I think that that's only one part of the inquiry. Uh, it's certainly correct that there's a question whether um, uh, Ms. Butler's, Ms. Butler Truesdale's duties um, fall within the class, uh, are described well by the classification 1101-13, the uh, rental property, um, excuse me, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, rental property program specialist. Um, but that's not the whole question here. The question is whether the duties of her position um, are also essentially equivalent to the duties of um, one of the one of the 905 legal advisor positions, um, presumably 905-13, but we don't have to worry too much about the details either there. Um, and it seems to me that's the central question in the appeal before us. And the issue is whether, I mean, the, the director made a finding on it. She said that the work of uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Butler Truesdale's position, quote, does not entail the level of substantive legal work that are typical of the LA 905 series. And I think the problem we're having is that we don't see either a rationale articulated for that conclusion or substantive, substantial evidence supporting it. Um, thank you, Judge Glickman. I, I would respectfully disagree that the second question is really the question before the court. Um, as this court's precedents make clear, even if substantial evidence would support a contrary agency conclusion, so long as substantial evidence supports the conclusion the agency did come to, the court has to affirm that decision. So even if- Right, and that's the question that the, that's the, uh, what I'm suggesting to you is we don't see that substantial evidence supports the conclusion that Ms. Butler Truesdale's um, uh, position, doesn't the work of her position does not entail the level of substantive legal work. I mean, have you compared the language of 1101-13 with the language of say 905-13? I have, Your Honor. I mean, to me, those things are describing much the same activity. I take it that the government does not um, uh, take the position that uh, an attorney has to be involved in litigation in order to be properly classified in 905.13. And I take it the government is not taking the position that um, the work must constitute the unauthorized practice of law if it were performed by a non-attorney to fall within 905.13. Um, and I agree with both of those <laughs> positions as, as you could sort of infer. My problem is I just don't see anything in the record that supports the, um, or that explains the, 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 uh, the um, 
conclusion, which I think is the $64,000 question here, because of the principle that Ms. Butler Truesdale alluded to that underlies all of the uh, classification rules, which is that equal, equal work gets equal pay and therefore equal classification. Yes, sir. I think I think there's a couple of questions packed in there. I'd like to address. I admit it. Um, so, so again, back to my first point. I think the issue isn't whether Ms. Butler Truesdale could be classified as an attorney in the 905 series. That is not the question. The question is whether she's the the existing classification, the 1101, accurately describes her duties. And if there's substantial evidence I, to support that, I, before you move on to that, let me just ask you about that. So. I guess I had been looking at that a little bit differently and thinking it's possible that you'd have a job description and you would look at two different classifications and you would say, you know, this could arguably fit in either. And then the issue would be, which is the better fit? Do you agree that that's, if, if I, you know, what the director uh, should have been doing here was not just saying, well, someone is complaining about, you know, attorney advisor 905. I'm not even going to look at that. I'm going to look at the job description. I'm going to look at 1101. And if that seems like an adequate fit, I'm done. Do you, th do you think the, the director could have done that? Or do you think the director was required to look both at whether the job description fit adequately with 1101, but also to look and see whether maybe it fit um, more uh, appropriately under 905? I think it would be possible for the director to um, do kind of the first, um, as you described it, because I don't think there's any requirement that the employee um, necessarily identify a specific other position. Ms. Butler Truesdale did identify an alternative classification that she thought was appropriate. So the director did analyze that in her final decision about why that wasn't an appropriate. But just to be clear, you think you think that if the, the director in this case, if the director in this case had said, Ms. Butler Trudeau is, uh, Truesdale is, is, is asserting that the proper job description for her is, you know, attorney advisor in the 905 series. Um, I am not gonna consider her arguments about any of that unless I first conclude when I look at her job description and the description of uh, the classification for 1101, that there is a disconnect. And I've looked at them, no disconnect. They're a reasonable fit. My job is done. I'm not gonna consider any of Ms. Butler Truesdale's arguments. Do you think that would have been a permissible ruling by the uh, 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 director of uh, uh, DHR? A couple of responses, Your Honor. First, I think it's important to know that these classification determinations can come up in different contexts. So employees could be asking simply to change the description of their duties. They could be asking to change the grade that they're um, that they're classified as. Um, so it could come up in different contexts, and it might not be necessary for the director to address, you know, other alternative positions. But in this case, um, I think she she did respond to Ms. Butler Truesdale's arguments about why not. I, well, I, I mean, I, I'm and, sorry to interrupt, but you said two things so far, and neither one is really an answer to the exact question I asked. Um, I see there's people are frozen. Can everyone really hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you. Are you able to hear okay. me? Yes, I can. You're visually frozen, so we might be having a little bit of a, a technical problem here. But uh, in any event, my again, my exact question is, it's a hypothetical question, which is imagine that the argument was as I described, and the, and the director had just said, I'm not going to consider her, her suggested alternative classification. I'm looking only at the one that is currently applicable. And if it's an adequate fit, I'm going to leave her where she was. Is that, would that have been a permissible response uh, uh, by the director? I think and, if, it was, if it was supported by substantial evidence in the record, Your Honor, I think it would be an adequate response. Um, I think if there's substantial think, evidence to support that conclusion. So if the, the, the job of the director is to figure out like what the right class is to say, I'm going to only look at one and in isolation, it seems adequate without actually comparing the other. That seems like a, a not the most obvious reading of the, the, the job that the director reasonably should be understood to have. 
Well, well, Your Honor, the job for the director is to compare the duties and responsibilities of the job and compare them to the classification. There are hundreds, probably thousands of different classifications um, under the OPM standards. So um, the director's job, and you know, this is why we have human resources specialists do this, is that it's a it's not a mechanical process of matching, you know, this element of the job duty with this. Um, job description, it, it, it's a process that requires a lot of um, factual finding um, and analysis and expertise, um, which is uh, part of, you know, why we have DCHR to make these determinations in the first place. Um, and it's not this court's job to kind of step into that role and, you know, make these classification judgments from the get-go. Um, if, if I'm, I could... I'm having a little trouble understanding your position. Suppose you have um, two classifications. One, one will call them the 1100 classification and the other the 905 classification. And um, and employees, and the, and the big thing, you know, what's really at stake here is money. Let's assume that the 905 classification pays a lot more than the 1100 classification. And an employee comes in and says, look, I'm doing the work of the 905 classification. I'm also doing the work of the 1100 classification. But the, the guiding principle in classification is that across the board in District of Columbia government employment, equal work gets equal pay. So unless you want to lower all the pay of the 900 people, you've got to raise me up to, to those people. That's Ms. Truesdale, that's Ms. Butler Truesdale's argument here. And it's no answer to say to that argument, well, um, we can keep you with that lower salary because you, you because you're, what you're doing does fit within the characterization of the 1100 classification. It's simply a non-answer to the issue. What am I missing? Well, Your Honor, again, I think we're getting a little bit far afield from the factual um, conclusions here. The director did- We're not, the director, we're not, but the director recognized that this is the issue. That's why the director addressed the question of whether uh, Ms. Butler Truesdale's work, quote, entailed the level of substantive legal work that are typical of the LA 905 series. Yes, sir. And I, I, that I, I, does I, seem to me to be the, the, the central question here. And I think that that decision was supported by substantial evidence because What's the substantial no, evidence. So there's no, there's nothing in the record that suggests that Ms. Butler Trusto has an attorney client relationship with the district or her employer or outside third parties, renters. Um, Are you telling me that every attorney in the district of, in the employee of the district of Columbia government who has an LA 905 series classification as an attorney client relationship, but Ms. Butler does not. Well, Your Honor, I think if you look at Not the that there's any evidence of this in the record, but. Well, Your Honor, if you look at the 905 series description, it focuses on two things. The first is that the person is engaged in litigation. And the second is that they have an attorney client relationship where they're providing legal advice. So those are the hallmarks of the 905 position. And I think um, as the director said, there's a number of policy positions similar to Ms. Butler Truesdale's. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know where you find that in 905. Find those things in 905. I, it'll take me a minute to pull 905 here, but. <laughs> yeah. um, I so, thought you agreed with me earlier that you don't have to be a litigating attorney. You don't, have, but you, you do need to have a legal attorney client relationship in order to provide legal advice. I mean, that's a-, that's well, a Ms. Cutler's, Ms. Uh, well, excuse me, but Ms. Butler's position has her the description, both by the director and um, her class, her 1101 classification, has her providing legal advice. I, I would respectfully disagree with that, Your Honor. Her, neither her position nor the duties that they actually found she was performing required her to provide legal advice. Um, they, she provides policy advice. She's an expert technical policy advisor, like many policy advisors in the D.C. government. You but, advise... You advise um, the rent administrator, this is the director speaking. You advise the rent administrator on potentially controversial legal and statutory issues involving tenants and landlords. Um, you prepare, dot, 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 you render, excuse me, you render advice and assistance on these matters, administrative orders 
to the rent administrator. You advise housing providers of their responsibilities for complying with the requirements of the Rental Housing Act. That, those are findings by the director. That sounds like providing legal advice to me. Well, um, Your Honor, I, I, would, I would respectfully disagree with that um, because I think a number of policy positions advise about legal issues. I'm just, um, I, don't, I don't doubt it. I'm just taking your, um, I'm just responding to what you said, which is that um, her position doesn't involve the provision of legal advice. And by the way, there's a lot more than that than what, what the director said. If you actually look at um, the rental property program specialist classification, the description of it, which goes on for several pages, so I'm not going to try to quote too much, but it repeatedly talked about providing legal advice. Well, Your Honor, I, again, I think... And it certainly doesn't say anything. I mean, the attorney advisor um, description, either OPMs or the districts, doesn't say anything about having an attorney-client uh, relationship, and it doesn't require litigation. I agree it does not require litigation, Your Honor, but I would I would again respectfully disagree for two reasons. Um, one is that Ms. Butler Truesdale's job description clearly states that you do not need to be an attorney to perform the role, that you're providing technical advice is the term that's used by her policy, by her description. And if you look at the it's attorney... Critical what her job description says and more critical what she actually does and what the rent and what the director found that she did. And I think Judge Whitman mentioned this, but the director said, made a, seems like a finding that Ms. Butler Truesdale advises the rent, advises the rent administrator on potentially controversial legal and statutory issues. How, how was that not a finding that uh, Ms. Uh, Butler Truesdale provides legal advice? Well, Your Honor, I, I simply, it's not because it's, like many policy advisors, she's providing advice about laws and regulations. It doesn't mean that she's providing legal advice as an attorney to the district. And did her the and series did the advisor supported the classification of her as uh, an attorney advisor? I'm sorry, Your Honor, I, I missed the first part. Am I right in recalling that her supervisor, the rent administrator, supported her position that her job duties were best classified as those of an attorney or better classified as those of an attorney advisor? She did, Your Honor. And that was based on Ms. Butler's Truesdale's status as an attorney, but not based, it's not a personnel conclusion based on her job responsibilities compared to the job responsibilities of the two classifications at issue. So that's a judgment for the HR specialist. So, and I think as you alluded to um, earlier, just because someone is an attorney, does not automatically make them appropriately classified in the 905 series. Um, Can I ask you back to this question? Um, what is the evidence that employees of the district who are uh, categorized as, or classified as in the LA 905 series are doing a level of substantive legal work that is different from what Ms. Butler Truesdale's position called for and what the director found she was doing. And uh, uh, so what's, what's the evidence in, in, that we can find uh, that supports that? Certainly, Your Honor. So I think if you look at the very first sentence of the 905 position classification description, it says, this series includes professional legal positions involved in one, preparing cases for trial and or the trial of cases before. Um, and or, and or. And or. Okay, go ahead. The second, the second one is rendering legal advice, and I think it's there's a critical distinction between legal advice and policy advice. I mean, many positions advise about laws. Um, they don't have to be held by attorneys. Um, it would really transform a number of positions in the D.C. government into attorney advisor positions if the court concluded that any time someone with a J.D. or a member of the bar is advising about policy, even though they were hired into a position that you know, you say about policy, but the director found advising about about law. Policy advice about law, Your Honor. I think well, that's not the director. Found. I mean, that's your term, but where is that in the director's finding? Well, Your Honor, I I, I think that the um, you advise the rent administration on potentially controversial legal and statutory issues involving tenants and landlords doesn't say anywhere that it's legal advice. I mean. I think you would have to be imputing that. I, 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 I mean, the words legal and advice are not immediately adjacent to, uh, to each other. That's true. But 
if I advise on a legal issue, are you, you saying I could, a finding that someone is advising on a legal issue is not a finding that they're providing legal advice. You think there's a distinction between those based on the order of the terms? I think based on the context in which the director made the statement, Your Honor, and that she was affirming that Ms. Butler Truesdale's position description accurately describes her as a policy advisor and not a legal advisor. And so Can I ask, but when I was asking you about evidence, what you referred to was the, 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 the 905 definition. And I, I'm not sure what, uh, you were quoting a sentence that was slightly different from the version I was looking at. So maybe there are multiple versions. I was looking at the one that was in the uh, agency record at page 214. So it was a little bit different, it seemed, than whatever you were quoting. In any event, is there any other evidence about what people who are classified as uh, in the 905 series actually do? Or is the only evidence in this that supports, uh, that could possibly support the director's determination, just the, the description itself and nothing more? I, I don't think that there, there's a factual record about what everyone who holds that um, classification or what anyone, does. Or, or what anyone. No, Your Honor, but I, I think that the what DCHR is was explaining is it was else other than the description, to the extent there is any need for a factual support for the director's determination about what 905, uh, folks in the 905 classification do, is there any factual support for that conclusion other than just the description itself? I don't believe that there's there's any further analysis other than the description and I guess the agency's own expertise in dealing with classification decisions, which I, I think we can't discount here. This is, I mean, the, the classification specialists who were involved in this case, there were five different DCHR employees who took a look at this case. Their classification um, specialists at DCHR, this is all that they do. They examine um, people's job responsibilities. They do desk audits like occurred here. They interview people about what they do and they determine what the primary duties of the job are and whether- Did any of them, did any of them compare the primary duties of Ms. Butler Truesdale's job with the duties of a quote, typical um, uh, uh, person classified in the LA 905 series? I think that analysis is in the position evaluation statement, Your Honor, as well as the director's final decision. I mean, she talks about, um, you know, in her expertise, what is typical of the LA 905. All right. Well, in other words, it's an Ipsy Dixon. I'm the director. Of, I have expert, expertise and the, I find this. So that's the end of the inquiry. Well, I, I think it's a little bit more nuanced than that, Your Honor. I mean, the, the position evaluation statement is five pages of analysis about. Show, show me the nuance in the director's memorandum decision that explains that sentence that we've all been focusing on? Well, Your Honor, I think, you know, the position description of the 905 series is also in the record and it's extensive and it's not just a single, you know. I must tell you, I have compared it with the position description of, uh, yeah, <laughs> of Ms. Butler, uh, Truesdale, the 11 I can't keep all the numbers straight, the 11 yes. 13 description. And frankly, they seem like they're talking about the same thing. The only difference being that one is, one is general and the other has to do with a, a specific area of real estate, rental property and administrative law and the like. Let me ask you what I regard as a serious question here. Um, if we conclude that the director's uh, decision does not adequately is not that the director did not adequately explain her decision, and that there is no substantial evidence. It is not supported by substantial evidence in the record. What, in your view, should should our ruling uh, say? I think the appropriate course, Your Honor, would be to remand to the to the superior court with instructions to remand to the agency. I think if the issue is that they haven't adequately supported this decision, then the agency would on remand have to reevaluate and determine whether there was additional evidence that would support their conclusion. But and why is it why is it we shouldn't say that on the existing record, Miss Butler Truesdale wins and should be reclassified in the 905 series? Well, Your Honor, I think that would that would overstep respectfully this court's role, which is to determine whether the agency engaged in an adequate process. It's not to 
step into the shoes of the agency and make a decision about HR determinations. And I'm not sure that this court would want to become uh, the, a court that reviews all of these agency classification decisions um, and makes a, a, a judgment for itself about which, which classification should apply to which employee. Well, this went to Superior Court and um, on Ms. Truesdale's, uh, Ms. Butler Truesdale's challenge. And um, the, as I understand the standard of review, the question is whether the agency um, uh, demonstrated that its classification was correct. And Ms. Butler Truesdale presented evidence showing no, a different classification was correct. What, are, you, are you saying the court can't say, well, agency, you failed in your mission. You didn't present sufficient evidence to justify what you've done. And Ms. Butler Truesdale's showing has been adequate to show that she should be in the 905 series. I, I think- why, why, does she not, why does she not win under those circumstances? I, I understand the question. I, I think the, the regulation that describes the court's review says whether the agency decision is supported by substantial evidence. So I think the court would have to conclude that there's no possible way for the agency to support this classification with substantial evidence in order to, to actually reverse and, and order the agency to reclassify. Oh, in other words, the agency had a chance to respond to um, Ms. Butler Truesdale's showing and um, uh, we say, well, it failed to do so. Why, why do they get a do-over? Well, because I, th I think the, the question is whether the agency engaged in an adequate process. And if you find the process was improper, that doesn't necessarily mean that the outcome was improper. So you would have to give them instruction about what would be um, more sufficient. And, and I mean, certainly the court could find that um, there's no other possible classification that would be appropriate for this position. But I think that would be a real stretch. But, but the court on this record find that a 905 classification was appropriate. I think it would, I, I don't think it could, Your Honor. And I think the key issue is that nothing in Ms. Butler Truesdale's position description of the rental program, uh, rental property program specialist requires her to be an attorney, requires her to have a legal attorney client relationship with the district or anyone else. And those are the hallmarks of the 905 series. So you would have to completely rewrite her position description in order to make- I mean, it sounds like the rental administrator thought she did have an attorney client relationship with her, but putting that aside, um, I, I guess your argument would be that uh, because there is no evidence in the record about the duties and, and responsibilities of the 905 series uh, classified people, we really can't say one way or another how this case should come out. And, and the remand would require uh, uh, further proceedings, presumably in the Superior Court. But, well, it would, it would do two things, I suppose. It would reverse the director's decision as inadequately supported. And maybe you're right, maybe it has to go back to, to ground zero. Um, maybe, maybe the Superior Court would have to send it back uh, though an alternative would be for the uh, proceeding to continue in superior court with the parties um, given the opportunity to provide evidence about what the quote typical uh, LA 905 series uh, employee does and comparing that with, I'm just uncertain what the best courses here. Well, Your Honor, I, I think it would be appropriate to let the age. So first of all, the Superior Court is limited by rule one to the agency record. Um, so I think it would be unusual for them. To yes, that's right. Fact -finding. But I think that if this court concluded that what the agency should have done was develop a record about what people in the alternate proposed position actually do. And, and I, I would respectfully say that the description in the OPM manual about what an attorney does is primary evidence of what that role actually entails. I agree with you. If that's what well, you're relying on, it sounds to me like Ms. Butler, Ms. Tuesdale wins. Well, Your Honor, I, I, again, I think we maybe just view those descriptions differently. The key, the key elements of what makes someone in the 905 series, that they perform litigation or that they have an attorney-client relationship where they're providing legal advice. That's, those are the hallmarks of the... 
is the phrase attorney client relationship in the 905 description somewhere? I believe, I mean, the definition of rendering legal advice is that you have an attorney client relationship. I think, I mean, it's a basic principle of rule 49 and also of privilege law. I, I, again, exactly. I, 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 am I right to infer that your answer is no, but you construe the phrase legal advice to imply it? I don't want. I don't want to represent that the term attorney-client relationship is not anywhere in the, I believe, thirty-two page description of what an attorney uh, nine hundred five does. But the first sentence says legal advice, and I think that's a basic principle that you have to have an attorney-client relationship. Otherwise, it's not legal advice. An attorney can advise someone who's not their client, but it's not legal advice. It's not privilege unless there's that relationship of trust and confidence. That's that's a an elementary step of it to be legal advice versus <laughs> personal. Uh, there's another loose end I wanna to just uh, touch base on. Uh, there was also a dispute about the proper classification of Ms. Butler Truesdale's prior position as uh, on, on Bud's person. Um, yes, and the, the district had taken the view in its brief that that issue was not adequately preserved by Ms. Butler Truesdale. And in her reply brief, Ms. Butler Truesdale points to places where she believes it was adequately preserved. Do you have a response? Do you agree now that it was adequately preserved or do you adhere to the view that it was not? And if the latter, could you explain why? Well, I, I think we, we adhere to that, but I think the more important point is that the regulations do not permit DCHR to retroactively reclassify someone. So well, I know that's very important procedurally right now because the agency has, you know, that we don't have a decision by the director on any of that because the director didn't get into it as far as I can tell. Um, well, so, I think so I'm sure we, I, would, I would want to affirm on that ground, but let me, um, why do you adhere to it? What is it you think was lacking in its preservation, uh, the preservation of that point? Well, I, I, I think it, I, I believe it's a, a single sentence in her in her appeal that she addressed. Um, our position would be that wouldn't be adequate, but I think the more important issue is that if you look at six B DCMR eleven twelve, subsection five. It says that that classification decisions cannot be retroactive. So there's no there's no mechanism for DCHR to, to retroactively reclassify a position that she held. What's the citation to that again, please? Uh, apologies, are six B DCMR one 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 two point five, and I will note that the reg has uh, appears to have a typo. There's two subsection point five, and it's the second one. So point six, I guess, would probably be the, the more accurate um, numbering. Um, and it says that decisions won't be retroactive. There, there is an exception for when someone has received a demotion and they seek to appeal that and it's overturned, then the decision can be made retroactive back to the demotion, but that's, that's not what occurred here. So um, there's no other way for the decisions to be made retroactive. Um, so I, I just don't, I don't think there's any, there's any way to, for the director to have addressed the ombudsman position. Um, which is why um, she didn't. Just to be clear, are you saying there is no evidence in the record before the director uh, and, and, and proffered in Superior Court that um, uh, Ms. Butler Truesdale rendered legal advice to the rental administrator? I, I'm sure that Ms. Butler Truzilla is, is using her legal expertise when she's providing policy advice, but the, the inquiry is kind of two parts. The first is they look at the actual job duties. They do a desk audit. Ms. Butler Truzilla was interviewed for three hours. Her boss was interviewed. They compare that to the written position description and determine whether the written position description is accurate. They determined that it was. Um, and then the question is whether that position description is accurately classified. And the position description therefore becomes the primary evidence about what her primary job duties and responsibilities are. And nothing in that position description requires someone to be an attorney or to so provide that gets legal back to the, That gets back to the question we've been discussing earlier, which is regardless of the position description, if what Ms. Butler, Taylor, Butler Truesdale is actually doing is rendering legal advice and um, then uh, she's entitled to a reclassification. And I think that respectfully, Ms. Butler Truesdale has focused on elements of her position description that she would 
characterize as providing legal advice, but doesn't dispute that the position description accurately describes what she's actually doing. Well, you know, it, it, it could well be the case that the, the district is right, ultimately. But the problem we have is that it hasn't marshaled the evidence to show it's right or articulated clearly the reason why it's right. And I think, Your Honor, if you look at the entire record here, I mean, it's 1,300 pages. The, the district um, engaged in a lengthy interview of Ms. Butler Truesdale. She was interviewed by two people. They took extensive notes. They wrote a summary of what her um, actual job duties were. Actually, it's sort of interesting because in your brief on appeal, you basically tell us, um, well, don't, you know, we don't have to look at all that because we, we, all we really need to look at is the director's decision. Well, Your Honor, our point was that the director's decision is the final decision that the court examines, but you have to compare it against the record that the agency compiled to determine whether it's supported by substantial evidence. Right, and your brief doesn't do that. Well, respectfully, Your Honor, I, I think that the director's decision is supported by substantial evidence because the agency engaged in a lengthy process. Ms. Butler Truesdale was able to answer written questions. She was interviewed personally. She was able to submit any evidence that she wanted to submit. The agency considered it and it gave her a fair process and then it was appealed and she had another chance to be interviewed and her boss had another chance to be interviewed. And the agency ultimately exercised its judgment about what the proper classification was. And that's-, that's And, and if, the, if the director's opinion had gone through all of that material and had said uh, some of the things that you are arguing today maybe there would have been an adequate explanation. Maybe the record would have supported them. Maybe if the director had said, well, there is no attorney-client privilege and here's why I conclude that. And here's why I think that's uh, critically important. Uh, you know, then we might be deferring to the expertise of the, uh, assuming we thought the those materials supported these conclusions, we might be in a position to defer to the director, but it's a little hard to do that when the director's explanation on the topic is that one sentence, which is uh, really doesn't explain what level of uh, um, legal, substantive legal work is uh, required or typically done or why, why specifically what uh, Ms. Butler Truesdale's job description reflects or her actual duties cons uh, consist of fall short of that. So it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult to defer uh, if we're requiring adequate explanation, it's difficult to, to find it here, I have to say. Well, Your Honor, I think it's important to remember that this isn't a contested case and it's not subject to the rules of a contested case. That there's no requirement of you know, formal written findings, extensive legal analysis. The director simply has to evaluate the evidence before it, which is largely factual and it's largely not tied to a legal standard. It's a, it's a personnel classification standard, which these, you know, these classifications are, are extensive and there's a, you know, probably a lot of positions that have some duties that would fit within multiple classification, but that's why an HR specialist has to exercise some judgment. It's not a mechanical process. Understood, and that's why someone who's reviewing it uh, would probably want to explain in some detail a conclusion, but, and I, I take your point, it's not a contested case, so no formal requirement of findings of fact and conclusions of law, but are you saying there's no need for an adequate explanation that the general principles of administrative law don't apply, or do you agree that we need to have an adequate explanation of the director's ruling, and if we don't, we should at least send it back for that. If we don't, I understand you think we do, but if we if we conclude, this is just not, general principles of administrative law would say, this is not an adequate explanation. Yeah, you you know, would agree we should send it back if we conclude that? Or? The, the standard is whether the decision is supported by substantial evidence. Um, and obviously the ordinary arbitrary and capricious kind of background principles apply as well. But all the agency had to do was ensure that Ms. Butler Truesdale had an adequate process and, and, and I'm, I'm a little sure about the direct answer to my question. If we conclude that, well, let me ask you this. Do you think that a requirement of adequate explanation applies to the director's decision? Is that a legal requirement to, uh, that is applicable here? Yes, Your Honor. They, they have to adequately explain the decision. It has to be rational and it has to be supported by substantial evidence. Um, but it's not a requirement that they engage in an extensive fact finding with legal analysis, you know, addressing every possible issue, they just have to explain their decision in a rational way. And I think the director did that here when she said, look, here are the five core requirements of your job. These are not 
what is typical of an attorney in the 905 series. An attorney in the 905 series normally performs litigation or has a legal relationship, a legal attorney-client relationship. Well, the words you're saying, I mean, the words you're saying now, I don't see in the in the director's decision. Or I might, did I miss a part of it or? I apologize, Aaron. I mean, the director's decision goes through the five core duties that she finds that Ms. butler Trusdale performs. Um, respectfully, I don't think any of those would necessarily. No, no, I, I was with you when you said you were kind of paraphrasing the director's decision, and I was with you when you said listing the duties and saying it didn't have the level, uh, you know, the the level of substantive work typical. Yes, that paraphrase, but then you started going off on what I thought was a continued paraphrase about normally those have litigation, normally those have attorney-client privilege uh, relationships. I didn't see any of that in the director's decision. I did it, uh, in the position evaluation statement. There is reference to litigation as being normally entailed, though I'm not sure that if the only evidence is the description in 905. I'm not sure that that description establishes that litigation is normally required. I apologize, Aaron. I was I was paraphrasing also the 905 series description, which the first sentence of which describes the role as someone engaged in litigation or providing legal advice. And are you um, quoting so, there the OPM definition, or are you quoting the the DC Attorney Advisor LA 90513 description uh, that was in the administrative record? Um, I apologize if I was if I I think I might have been reading from the the OPM standard um, earlier, but I think essentially the, the two descriptions map onto one another, even though they use slightly different language. Um, and I think the core um, hallmarks of the position are the same, which is either that you're engaged in litigation, which requires you to be a member of the bar, uh, or you're providing legal advice, which requires you to be a member of the bar. Um, and, and legal advice, as I've said, requires an attorney-client relationship of some sort before you can call it legal advice. Um, so I, I think the director was considering all of that. She obviously had all of this information available to her. And, you know, her description was, that's not what your position entails. Your position is these five things, none of which require someone to provide legal advice or engage in litigation or even be a member of the bar. And I, I'm certain- Can I ask you a question? One thing I'm wondering about is when Ms. Pear, the rental administrator, goes to Ms. Butler Truesdale and- says to her, what's the proper legal interpretation of this regulation? So, uh, and Ms. Truesdale, and Ms. Butler Truesdale says, well, here's my, let's say she doesn't use the word advice, but, but here's my answer to your, to your question. The proper legal interpretation of this regulation is X. And Ms. Pear says, thank you, I will act on that. That's how I'm gonna proceed. Is that a case of advising, uh, of providing legal advice? Well, Your Honor, I think that Part of what DCHR often does is that they advise supervisors that you're asking the employee to do something that goes beyond their position description. So in that case, Ms. Butler Truesdale could talk to DCHR and they would talk to her supervisor and say, you're not, she's not acting as your attorney. You can't ask her to provide legal advice. Um, so to the extent that that is getting confused in the mix, that's commonly a thing that DCHR does as part of these desks. Uh, uh, previously, I mean, I'm sorry, go ahead, Judge, please. I was going to say, I thought that part of her, Ms. Butler Truesdale's argument was, whatever my job description is, I'm being asked to, and I am doing things that make me an attorney, and that shouldn't only be done by attorneys, that actually fit well under DC 905. Uh, uh, and uh, so I'm not sure if, if, if the point was, well, that really isn't in your current job description. I'm not sure that would defeat her classification claim. Um, and, and just to be clear, I, I just, you think that if someone tried to subpoena Ms. Butler Truesdale and said, what advice did you give the rent administrator about how to interpret this legal provision? Mm -hmm. She'd have no, the, the district would have no claim of privilege. That's her I, think it would be, I think it would be a difficult case, Your Honor, because she is not an, an agency attorney. She's not- well, That's a difficult case. It follows directly from your position that there's no attorney-client relationship here and no attorney-client privilege. So I, I don't see why- I, I think that's right, Your Honor. I, I think I think the district would have a very difficult time justifying that as a, a, as a privilege claim because she's not I, operating as an agency attorney. Why, don't you, do you agree that not only would the district have a difficult time, the district would be, it would be incompatible with the position the district is taking in this litigation to try to argue that there was a privilege? I think that's correct, Your Honor. 
Uh, and I, I think that that rationally flows from Ms. Butler Truesdale's job description when she was hired and, and how the position was advertised. It's not an attorney role. She's merely providing attorney advice. Now there, you know, there could be other potential, um, you know, protections for such communications, but I, I think it would be, um, it would be not be the case that she has a, a legal relationship, attorney-client relationship that would, that would create a legal privilege. Um, well, I, I mean, it's very interesting to, to me. What you're saying is, A, some of the director's findings are wrong because the director, uh, because the director finds that Ms. Uh, Butler Truesdale does, does give uh, that kind of advice that I've just described. And number two, you're suggesting that, well, Ms. Butler Truesdale, much of what you've been doing, much of what the record shows you've been doing uh, in support of the mission of the um, Department of Housing and Community Development um, and in support of the rental administrator, rental accommodate, rental, uh, the, the, uh, the, rental, the rent administrator is just beyond the scope of your duties. Stop, stop doing them. Well, your Honor, I, I, I mean, I it's an extraordinary point. position, it seems to me, for the district to take, quite frankly. Well, Your Honor, I, I think respectfully, I, I don't agree that the rent administrator's findings were incorrect. I, I think we're characterizing the rent administrator's conclusions differently. Uh, based on what the rent administrator said, that she does not view the position as an attorney position, I think the fourth bullet of her description about advising the rent administrator about legal topics does not mean she's providing legal advice. She's providing policy advice about laws, which is what many people do. What's the difference oh, between when, 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 when Ms. Butler Tuesdale says, here's what this legislation means. What, why is that policy advice rather than legal advice? Because she doesn't have an attorney-client relationship with the- Well, that's circular. Attorney. Well, then you, that's just circular. That, that's just circular reasoning. That's not an answer. I mean, Your Honor, that's the hallmark of what makes something legal advice is that you have an attorney and a client- What's the, what the evidence that she doesn't have an attorney-client relationship with the rent administrator? Well, Your Honor, it's it's simply not. There's no evidence that she that she would have one. It wouldn't be reasonable based on her position. Well, why not? If, if, if uh, I mean, again, it, it it seems somewhat circular. If uh, it's true that she uh, is asked uh, by uh, her employer, I mean, there's a really interesting set of topics about how and what kinds of attorney-client relationships form inside of governmental entities. And maybe you're tapping into those complexities, but just in terms of what the evidence was, is that, is there, did anybody come in and say, oh uh, yeah, Ms. Butler Truesdale, definitely. I don't think of her as having uh, any attorney client relationship. And I, I mean, the client would be the district maybe uh, on one conceptualization of it. And what is it that says she has no attorney client relationship with the district? Where is that in the evidence or what, what material is Wait, I think the primary lie. piece of evidence, Your Honor, is her position description, which does not require her to be an attorney and doesn't say anything about legal advice. So someone, someone could fill her role who's not an attorney. I think that that's pretty clear from the position description. That person wouldn't be providing what legal about, advice when they provide. Actually, what about and what about um, uh, to the extent that some of what she's being asked to do? I mean, if, if you're right that the 1101 description. You just you can't do legal advice out of there. It's incompatible with being under 1101. Then uh, that's part of Ms. Butler Truesdale's point: is that's a classification that doesn't really relate to what I'm doing. What I'm being asked to do is the rent administrator comes to me because I'm an attorney and says, "Give me advice about controversial and difficult legal questions," and I give the rent administrator that advice. Now, assuming that's true factually. Do you agree that there is an attorney-client privilege if that is true factually, or do you think there isn't any way? And if there isn't any way, why not? What's lacking? What's missing? I think I, I wouldn't agree that that is happening factually, Your Honor. The, the desk audit itself went through all of her actual day-to-day -day job duties. You know, they interviewed her, they looked at her workspace, they did everything, and they concluded that she wasn't operating as an attorney in that, in that sense. Did um, they explain that conclusion? I believe they did, Your Honor. If you look at the position evaluation statement, um, which is, starts on page 10 of the record, um, they talk about all of her different job duties, and none of them, respectfully, would entail the provision of legal advice. 
Um, and it certainly wouldn't be her primary responsibility. Um, so, so I think that factually, that's just not what the agency found. What, what, you give me a site to the record that you want me to look at. Well, if you the position description starts on page ten, and I think it's the first two pages that go through her actual. Wait, by position description, uh, I'm not page ten. Sorry, position evaluation statement, Your Honor. I apologize. It, it's page ten and eleven of the administrative record. I'm not quite sure what page it is. Uh, if, it's it's appendix um, seventeen of the PDF, Your Honor, but it's not separately numbered. But it's the record page ten. And the explanation there, I thought, was mostly she doesn't do litigation. That's that's part of the explanation, Your Honor. But you know, if you look at the position information and they talk about how she conducts research, she communicates and liaises with the public, she advises rent uh, tenants and landlords about what the laws are. None of those are an attorney advisor role. Oh, understood. And let me just ask you: Is it fair to say that part of Ms. Butler? Truesdale's response to the position evaluation statement and the argument she made to the director was, this isn't really capturing what I do. I do well, things that are legal in character, and here's a list of them. And well, the, if the list of them that she proposed, oh, apologies, Aaron. Yeah, is that true? Is that true that that was part of what, you know, part of her point in appealing to the director was, this is what the position evaluation statement says, but here's the real, here's what I'm really doing. Aaron, is that part, she, part of her complaint? Her complaint was she identified, I think it's 21 items in her job description, the written job description that she contends are legal duties. And I, I think that, um, so that's not disputing that the written description is, is accurate. It's just re she recharacterizes them as legal duties. You know, I provide advice and I'm, I, I would consider that legal advice. So it's, it's, it's not a, it's not a was it, about factually what you're, you're, right. You're, you're right as far as it goes about those 21. But are you saying that it wasn't also a component of her argument? I, here's what I'm actually doing. I don't believe she's ever identified anything outside of the written description that she claims was missed. Um, she's just recharacterizing the, the job description as legal duties versus policy duties. So I, I, don't, I don't think there's any record of anything outside of that um, that's been presented to the agency or to the court. Um, and if you look at the primary duties of the position, I think it's entirely reasonable to conclude that this is not something that an attorney advisor would be doing. They would not be. How do we know? We don't. Oh, well, you would say compare it to the to the 905 series. Yes, Your Honor. If you compare it to the 905 or the 1101, it's a policy position that helps the public understand the, the laws. That's a big part of her job. Um, and she is a policy advisor to the rent administrator, like I mean, and the director identified many other policy positions that are very similar. They provide policy advice about specific topics. Um, they don't have to be held by an attorney. They don't create a legal attorney-client relationship. They're not providing legal advice. So all are there, are there lawyers uh, hired by the government and given a 905 classification who aren't really providing legal advice to their um, supervisors or whatever? They are doing other kinds of legal work, such as um, responding to the public, um, preparing drafts of legislation um, uh, and rules and regulations. I wonder whether, the, even, if it is, even if it is true that, uh, that an employee of the government is not providing, quote, legal advice, to a decision maker in the government. The employee might still be within the typical, and not litigating, the employee might still be within the typical um, description of, an, of a 905 series uh, person, because a lot of legal work you know, is in that category I'm referring to. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, there's certainly a lot of different positions in the government that are classified as 905s. I, I, I'll, I'll take that. And I would agree that not all of them are litigating. I think those that are, are doing things like preparing contracts and stuff like that are, are providing legal advice in the process of a transaction. Um, so I, th I think it would be unusual for an attorney to be in a purely policy role and be classified as a 905. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but that would be kind of a different question than whether it's hard for me to say, 
I mean, just looking at the director's findings, and I, I don't want to prolong this any further, but just, just looking at the director's findings, it's hard to see that um, the director found that Ms. Butler Truesdale is not doing any of those kinds of things that attorneys typically do. She advises people on their responsibilities for complying with the law and the and that, statute and how to file complaints. And she advises the administrator on controversial legal and statutory issues involving tenants and landlords. And she drafts legislation and regulations and policies for the agency. And she prepares administrative orders and renders advice to the rent to, uh, and assistance on these matters to the rental administrator, rent administrator. I mean, just looking at what the director has found, that sounds to me like it's, that's not policy advice, that's legal advice. That's being a lawyer. Whether, she, whether the position in terms requires a person to be a lawyer or not is really, really seems to me beside the point. What, what, what the, and, and, and all those things are consistent with the description of the position in 1101. Um, it, it just sounds to me like what the rent administrator has said is, yeah, she's acting like a lawyer, but for some reason that I haven't disclosed yet, she's not. She, it's not at the level of substantive legal work that is typical of the LA nine hundred five series, and, um, you know, without more, I, I, just because the direct, just because the director can say, well, we spent a lot of time on this case, and we did a lot of interviewing, and we. <laughs> And I'm an expert, and my people are experts, and we know that we know the regulations. Um, what's lacking seems to me rather, you know, immense. We are. I think that respectfully, a lot of positions in the DC government and the federal government could be described as providing advice about laws and regulations, and telling members of the public about what to do and um, and how to comply with the rules. I mean, that's. That's a primary function of the DC government. So, so it would be maybe they should be classified as lawyers. I think that would be an enormous change to how the DC government operates. Well, maybe they ought to much. figure out a better way to to, to to distinguish between what lawyers do and have to do and what other people have to do. And I think if you look at those those, um, those well, not five, classify them as lawyers, but pay them as lawyers if they're doing lawyers' work. We are, I, I think the point is that they're not doing lawyers work. Advising the public about what the laws are is not legal advice. And I don't think there's any, any contention in the record that it would be legal advice. The public is not Ms. Butler Truesdale's client and she can't advise them as a lawyer about what to do. She can provide help as a government employee about what the policies are and what they need to do and what forms they need to file, but it's not legal advice and no reasonable person would consider it to be so. Um, so, and it certainly wouldn't be privileged. Um, so I think that is a big part of Ms. Butler Truesdale's job. Um, and from all accounts, she does it extremely well, but it's not the role of an attorney advisor to the rent administrator. It is the role of a policy expert who's helping people navigate uh, complex housing regulations. So I, I think it would be, um, an extreme change to how the DC government operates that everyone who provides that kind of advice to the public or advises a policymaker about, you know, there's this controversial law, I think it'll be problematic for these policy reasons um, and say, well, that person's operating as a lawyer. They have to be an attorney. They need to be reclassified and paid in a different way. Um, I think that would, that would be a big change. And I think it would be far afield from the substantial evidence test that this court is supposed to be applying to whether or not the decision is supportable by substantial evidence, not whether another position could be also supportable by substantial evidence, but whether this classification that the agency determined was the correct one in its judgment based on its expertise is supportable by substantial evidence. I think that's that's the test for the court is whether, whether the agency used its expertise and engaged in a fair process and gave Ms. Butler Truesdale a chance to support her arguments and looked at all of the information, and that's what the, the court is supposed to be evaluating. Um, thank you. Thank uh, you. Let us, Ms. Butler, uh, 
uh, Trusha, let us hear from you in rebuttal. Thank you so much, Your Honor. I, I, I very much appreciate the diligence with which it must have taken to go through the record and it's demonstrated in the questions that have been asked. And I, I really thank you for the display of uh, judicial excellence that I'm witnessing here. I want to share in confidence that it is highly probable that by the time that this case is decided, if I'm very, very lucky, Judge Herring will have me as her, one of her magistrates. I'm fighting this case for the people following behind me. The, matter, the, 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 the amount of time that it has taken to, to get this through the court has damaged my relationship with the agency. No case this simple should take this much time. It builds up a level of resentment in employees to come in and do functions like this, knowing that they're performing legal tasks on a daily basis and not be recognized for it. Now, there are two simple explanations that my opposing counsel seems to be dodging around respectfully. And one is that 42, uh, I'm sorry, section 423502.4, which describes the duties of the rent administrator, indicate that she can employ counsel, which is what she's done. Not only that, she has to be an attorney. I'm sorry, not, I mean to be gender neutral. The rent administrator has to be an, an attorney and she may delegate. Who is she going to delegate to? Me and Keith Anderson, the rental property specialist who are attorneys. And guess what? The agency has never had a rental property specialist who wasn't a licensed attorney, okay? Now, let me give you a little bit of lesson in governance. My office cannot engage in creating policy. Policy is created by the city council and the mayor. I engage in a regulatory function. The rent administrator is regulating the rental housing market much like uh, uh, the insurance market is regulated, the banking market is regulated, and utilities uh, market is regulated. We regulate rental housing. We are engaged in a regulatory function, not a policy function. If I create policy, I'm overstepping my bounds. This, I am a regulatory attorney. That is why I was hired, because I have a long history of serving as a hearing officer in various DC government agencies. I beg you not to simply remand this case to allow them to create more obstacles to a final resolution. And to be sure, I'm not really certain that this is not a matter in controversy but I really don't want to go very much further into that because maybe I missed something. Maybe I'm wrong. But I went through the APA, as I did explain to you, I am chair of the uh, administrative law section of the DC Bar uh, State um, uh, Committee on, it, on agency and administrative law. And I'm not so sure that this is not a matter in controversy pursuant to the DC Administrative Procedure Act, which by the way, needs to be amended, it's long overdue. But I'm really, really embarrassed that anybody would think that a regulatory agency has the, the, any role in creating policy. We do, we, that is the thing that we must stay away from is creating policy. The executive branch and the legislature, the, the mayor's office out of the executive branch, and the legislators create policy, okay? Not anyone on an agency level enforcing a regulation. I am to interpret what the statute says and create rules and regulations to implement that statute, not create the policy or make the policy decisions behind what, this, what the legislature has created. That is a very, very big mistake. And do you agree? Do you agree with the proposition that just because you do what is called legal work does not necessarily mean you are properly classified in the 905 series? No, I do not. The Office of Personnel Management created these 
classifications for government workers and we in DC have chosen to follow them for a specific reason. And it is to protect, it is to protect the worker and also to protect the citizenry to make sure that, that employees are being hired according to the specific skill set that they claim that they have. So when you create a 905 series and say that this is for the servants of the, uh, the public servants of the government who are have an expertise and in being an attorney and providing legal counsel, that's exactly what that means. I am providing legal counsel to the rent administrator. I even look at contract and procurement contracts that she may have to sign or, excuse me, agree to or confer with the Office of the Tenant Advocate on for a public facing database. I consider privacy issues. I even consider FOIA issues. I know opposing counsel just came to government from private practice and really may not have governance expertise, but that should not impact the employees who will come behind me because this has already taken too long, which is why I in fact hope that I will be serving in the third branch of government of my career, the judicial branch in a couple of months. That's where I hope to be going because they have distorted my career trajectory. My goal was to serve in the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judicial branch. I've done legislative, I've done executive, and I will hopefully be moving on to the judicial branch, but way before I intended to, because the amount of time that this office took to get this straight corrupted my outstanding relationship with my agency. It is a travesty. And someone without my legal skills wouldn't have even been able to get here. I rest. Also, thank you both. Uh, and uh, the case is now submitted and you may log off. Thank you, your honors. This thank honorable you. court is now adjourned.